going to do the same lecture today as what we're going to do next Monday. So if you pick it up today, you won't need to log in next Monday for it. Um, we're picking up with our second lesson here of Unit 2 on graphing. So on Friday, we looked at brute force graphing, basically, taking our equation, y equals 2x minus 4, and making a table, picking values for x, calculating what y has to be, and then plotting those points on a graph, and drawing our curve or line or whatever shape it is through those points. Today we want to look at some shortcuts, and specifically, um, a couple of shortcuts we'll look at in this course. The first one, of course, is for lines. Um, if there's time, we'll also look at that shape that we called a parabola. That was that somewhat U-shaped graph. The first step for either of these types of shapes, if we're going to do a shortcut to graph them quickly, is to identify which equations make that shape. And what it comes down to is something called the degree of an equation. The degree of an equation is simply the highest power on any variable. And typically what we're looking at is the independent variable. A little bit of review independent variable what that represents what that means is when we did our graph and we did our table x was the independent variable because that was the variable that we just picked values for it was independent of anything else we just randomly picked values to use we later went back and picked more values based on where the gaps were in our graph, but we could still pick whatever values you want. Those values were independent of the situation. The Y values were the dependent values. And typically for graphing, no matter what form we're graphing, the, the shortcut graphing form would be the equation of the form y equals. So what we're talking about here assumes that we're starting out with that basic form. We might modify it and rearrange it a little bit, but we have y equals. In other words, we have no other powers or anything else dealing with our y's, no other operations happening to our y's. So the degree of our equation is really saying What's the largest power on the independent variable or the x variable of our equation? If that power is 1, then it is a linear equation. It makes a straight line. If that degree is 2, in other words, the largest power on x is 2, then it makes that parabola. <clears throat> There are other shapes as that number gets bigger. Um, if it were a degree of three, it would be a cubic curve, they call it, kind of an S-curve. Um, four, well, it's a fourth degree curve. And, and a lot of it depends on what other smaller powers are included into it, but it still has the same basic general shape based simply on that largest power, or the degree of the equation. So what we're gonna focus on today are linear relationships, linear equations, where the degree is 1. So let's start by looking at our simplest possible linear equations.
and seeing how they look on our graph, basically. So the simplest one, this seems horrible, our simplest linear equation we could possibly use would be of the form y equals x. Notice degree of one, there's the power on x is one. Now we don't write it, but x does have a power of one. It's one of those invisible ones we talked about. The other is in front of it. That's really one x to the power of one, but we don't write those ones. They're, they're not useful. They don't add anything to it. If we have just that x by itself, it's implied that it is one x to the power of one. So the graph x to the one, or just y equals x, if I pick values for x and values for y, if I had x equals negative 3, of course, y would equal negative 3. So negative 3, negative 3, somewhere in there. If x were 0, y, of course, would be 0. If x were positive 3, y would be positive 3, like that. So we get that line that goes diagonal across our graph through the origin. Remember, we said this point here is the origin at the middle. That's where both axes start or have zeros. So that is our most basic linear um, line on the graph, linear equation. Well, if I want to alter that, I can alter that. Remember we talked about building equations in unit two. Um, to solve them, we had to look to see how they were built. Well, here we can make this more complicated by building on the equation. Now we saw in unit two, we can do any of our basic math operations, add, subtract, multiply, divide, powers, roots. But now remember, if we want it to be linear, we can't have powers or roots, it has to be first degree. So we're limited to those first four, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing are the only operations we can do that'll keep this linear. So let's try y equals x plus three. So if x were negative 3, y would be 0, because negative 3 plus 3 is 0. If for x were 0, 0 plus 3 would be 3, so y would be 3. And if x were 3, y would be 3 plus 3, or 6, like that. So we get another line. It is parallel to the first line. It goes across our graph at the same angle. All that has changed is it has moved up three spaces. Makes sense that when we add three to, to our variable, it just moves the graph up three units. So you can probably guess what would happen if we have y equals x minus two. If x is negative three, negative three minus two would be negative five. Be right there. If x was 0, 0 minus 2 would be negative 2, so right there. If x were 3, 3 minus 2 would be 1. We have 3, 1, right there. Once again, notice that this line is parallel to that original black line, the y equals x line. It's just been, from the origin, shifted down two units. Makes sense. We subtracted two from our variable, it shifted the graph down. Well, what would happen then if we multiply? <clears throat> Let's have y equals 2x. Well, if x equals negative 3, 2 times negative 3 is a negative 6. Y is negative 6. So that's going to be down here. If x was 0, 2 times 0 is 0. We're back to going through the origin. And if x is positive 3, 3 times 2 is a positive 6. So positive 3, positive 6 is right there. So you can see this is going back to going through the origin, but it's changed the angle it goes across the graph. It's a little bit steeper now. If we wanted it to go shallower, we, we could divide. Rather than divide, though, we're going to use the algebraic trick of multiplying by a fraction. So instead of y equals x divided by 3, we're going to do y equals 1 third times x. That's equivalent to y equals x divided by 3, or 
or x over 3. So again, let's fill in our table. If x is negative 3, 1 third times negative 3 is negative 1. So it gives us a point right there. If x were 0, 1 third times 0 would be 0. So still through the origin. And if x were positive 3, 3 times 1 third times 3 would be a positive 1 right there. So we get a line that still goes through the origin, but it's much flatter, much lower angle. One thing you might notice for all of these, as we go left to right, they go up, what we call increasing lines or increasing graphs. If we want it to de go be decreasing, you probably guess, we might try y equals a negative 2 times x. Now, if x is a negative 3, y is a positive 6. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. x is 0, y would still be 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. And if x is positive 3, y would be a negative 6. So 3, 6 would be right there. 0, 0. Positive 3, negative 6 is there. You can see that gives us our first decreasing line. As you move right or left to right across the graph, the line actually goes down in value. As the x values get bigger, the y values get smaller. Um, a term that will come out later, deep increasing lines are what we call directly related variables. As one variable gets larger, the other one gets larger. Decreasing lines are what we refer to as inversely related. or inverse variation. As one variable gets larger, the other one actually gets smaller. So as we see, saw here, because lines are so simple, there's only two things that can really happen to those lines. It could shift from the origin, instead of going through the origin, it could shift up or down, depending on what's happening. And we saw that that was the number added or subtracted that made that happen. And we saw that the angle could change. Our line could get steeper or shallower. And it was the number that multiplied x that made that happen. Multiply or divide, but instead of dividing, we multiply by the fraction. Well, the, the quantity that is described by this movement up and down is called the y-intercept. And what it is, it's actually significant to real-life application because it is the starting point. It is where the independent variable, or the x variable, equals zero. Now, if we're dealing with time, which often we are in medical applications, time is pretty much always the, met, the independent variable. I say pretty much because there are some rare exceptions, um, but it is... Pretty, mo most of the time, if time is involved, it is our independent variable. So the y-intercept is when the time is equal to zero, or at the beginning, the starting point. And then, of course, the, the other importance of that y-intercept is it's a baseline. So it's our beginning value that we're going to build on for everything else. The value that is described by that multiplying, changing the angle, is called slope. Now, slope is defined to be rise over run. In other words, it's the number of units you change in the y variable or the dependent variable for the num over the number of units you change in the independent variable, the x variable. It is also referred to as a rate of change. If I wanted to illustrate these values, let's say you start 
six blocks from home, and walk away from home at a rate of, let's do 18 blocks per hour. So your starting point here would be six blocks from home. That would be your y-intercept. So if I'm making a graph, one, two, three, four, five, six, that would be where this all started, right there. 18 blocks per hour, if this were one hour, we would have to go up, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I would see my scale is horrible here. We would have to go 18 more blocks away from home. So that line would increase by 18. It goes up 18 units. That is my dependent variable for a one unit increase in hours. We could actually write an equation from that pretty simply, um, where y is your blocks from home, again, that's your dependent variable, it depends on how long you've been walking, x is your time that you've been walking, and the simple equation would be y equals you started six blocks from home and you're adding 18 blocks for every hour. And that is the typical form that our linear equations take. Actually, we typically write it like this, mx plus b, where m is our slope and b is our y-intercept. You might be looking at this example here saying, well, you wrote it backwards. You did the y-intercept first and then the slope. In practical application, it often makes much more sense to do that, to start with the y-intercept and then add your slope times your variable to that because the y-intercept is where you're starting. We started at six blocks from home, and then we added 18 blocks for every hour after that. So the order that they're arranged can be adjusted depending on what your application is but it's still the number multiplying the variable is the slope, and the number that's added or subtracted then to that product is the y-intercept, regardless of whether it's arranged first or second. So to use this information to graph a linear equation quickly, if I have y equals 2 thirds x minus 4, So here's my, my graph. I start with the y-intercept, the minus four. So that means from the origin, I go down one, two, three, four. That is my first point on this graph. Then I go to my slope, the two thirds. And remember, slope is a rise over run. So it's two over three, the two is the rise. And what that means is from this starting point, my y-intercept, I rise or go up two. Then I run one, two, three. That's my second point right there. My line goes through those two points. If that wasn't enough to draw my line, I could have, from the second point, I could have risen to run one, two, three to get another point, and use that then two points to graph my line if I feel better with that. I might have y equals two x plus one. Well again, I start with the y-intercept, positive one, so that's gonna be up here. 
2 times x. Now that does not look like a fraction. Our slope is rise over run. Always has to be in the form of a fraction. I can make 2 into a fraction by simply putting 2 over 1. And now from this starting point, I have a rise of 2 and a run of 1. There's my second point. I can draw my line, if I'm careful, through those two points. Again, if I really wanted to, I could rise two and run one again and keep going and making more points as I go across the graph if I felt like I needed more, <coughs> excuse me, to make my line look good. I might have y equals negative three-fourths x plus five. So again, I start with my y-intercept and positive 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's my starting point. Now this is a negative 3 fourths. Whenever possible, we keep the run positive. Run is always left to right. The positive or negative goes with the rise. So since this is a negative 3 4 slope, we go down 3, and then we run 4. And there's the second point on our graph, and we can draw our line through those two points. Like that. We might have an equation that looks like this. y equals negative 2 minus 1 half x. This is in a different order, but it still works the same. The negative 1 half is multiplying x, so that's our slope. We're going to come back to that. The number that's added or subtracted is the negative 2. So from our, our origin, the center of our graph, we go down 2. That is our starting point. That's our y-intercept. From there, we use our slope, negative 1 half. We go down 1, and we run 2. There's our second point. Now those are a little close together, so I'm going to go down one and run two again to get a third point. And I can make my graph through those lines. And again, we were able to do this this quickly because we knew from the form of the equation that these had to be lines. Well, not all of our equations start out that simple. We might have an equation like this, y plus 3 equals 3 fifths x plus 1. Remember we said before that for our graphs, for our equations to be graphed, we want them in that form of y equals. And all the equations we looked at up here were in that form of y equals. This one is not. It's y plus 3 equals. So we want to alter it to fit that form. We want to get rid of the plus 3. Just like solving equations back in unit 2, we have to add, we want to get y alone here, not x. But it's the same process. We ask, what is keeping y from being alone? Here is the 3. The 3 was added to it, so we remove it by subtracting. Now, if we go back to our first week, we discussed that when we add or subtract, we must have the same name. So we can only combine numbers that have the same name or same place value. So when we add or subtract the 3, or here we're subtracting 3, we subtract 3 from one side to make this 3 go away to give us y, we do have to subtract 3 from the other side still to keep our equation balanced. This is still that balanced scale we discussed in Unit 2. But when we subtract 3, we can only subtract 3 from things that have the same name. It's three ones that we're subtracting, so we can subtract it from the one one. A positive one minus three makes a negative two. The three fifths x is not changed. There was nothing we could combine with that. So now looking at this equation, we start with our y-intercept of negative two. And from there, we go up three and run one, two, three, four, five to get our next point. 
and we can draw our line then through those two points. We might have something like 3y equals 6 minus 2x. So here, y is not alone again. It has the 3 there. 3 is multiplying y, so I'm going to get rid of it by dividing. Now again, going back to the first week of class, we said when we multiply or divide, we do not have to have the same name, which means we can multiply or divide anything. So remember, when we multiply or divide it, every digit of one number had to be combined with every digit of the other number. So that means that an equation is every piece or every digit in the equation has to be divided by three. Well, the 3y is just a single digit, so we divide it by 3, it cancels out the 3 to give us just y. On the right side, though, we have two digits. We have the 6 and we have the negative 2x. Both of those digits have to be divided by 3. 6 divided by 3 is just 2. That part's simple enough. Negative 2x divided by 3. Well, remember we've said previously that fractions and division problems are kind of interchangeable. And that's our shortcut for dividing here. We just turn it into a division or into a fraction. Negative 2 divided by 3 just becomes negative 2 thirds, and then the x is still there. The x is not affected by the operation with the numbers. So now we go to graph this. Our y intercept is the positive 2. Even though it comes first, it's still the number being added or subtracted. And our slope is the negative 2 thirds. Now remember, the negative goes with the rise. So from this starting point of two, we go down two and run three. There's our second point. If they were too close together, we could go down two more and run three more to get a third point. And we can draw our line through those points. We can have more than one thing being done to our y. Well, we might have 2y minus 3 uh, equals, let's do x minus 1. So when we look at this one, there are two things keeping y from being alone, the 2 and then minus 3. 2 is multiplying x, 3 is subtracting. So if this, when this was built, 2 was multiplied, or x was multiplied by 2, then the 3 was subtracted. Remember, when we take it apart, we go backwards. We take off the last piece first. So the first thing we have to do here is add the 3 to get rid of the subtracting 3. Again, when we add or subtract, we can only combine it with things that have the same name. So we added 3 to the left side. We add 3 to the right side. That's 3 ones. We can only combine it with our negative 1 ones. So on the left, we just have 2y left. We've got rid of the 3. The x is not changed on the right, but we have negative 1 plus 3 is a positive 2. Then we divide by the 2 because it's multiplying y. Remember when we multiply or divide, we can combine anything, so we have to multiply or divide every digit. So 2y divided by 2, the 2's cancel out. We just have y. Remember, 2y is just a single digit. It's a count and a name. x, well, you can think of that as 1x, so 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. x, and then 2 divided by 2 is a positive 1, so it's plus 1. So we go to graph this. We start at positive 1. That's our first point. And then we go up 1 over 2. Rise 1, run 2, give that second point. A little close together, so let's do it a second time. Rise one, run two. There's the third point. And our line, I've drawn those accurately, goes through those points on our graph. Well, these are just all variations of the graphing form of an equation. We can also run into something called um, standard form. And in standard form, it takes on one of two appearances. One of them might look like this. 3x plus 2y 
equals 6. If I want to graph this, I have to get it into that graphing form, y equals. So first thing I'm going to do, now I ask them, what's been done to y here? <clears throat> y is multiplied by 2, and then 3x has been added to it. Even though x is a variable, it's just part of the 3x being added to the y because we're looking at this from the viewpoint of the y in this case. So to solve this for y, we start by getting rid of the added 3x, so we're going to subtract 3x. So on the left side, the 3x is gone. We just have 2y left. On the right side, 6 minus 3x cannot be combined. They have different names. And when we add or subtract, we must have the same name. So 6 minus 3x becomes simply... 6 minus 3x. And then we have to divide by the 2. <clears throat> Dividing by the 2 gives us y. We have to divide each piece on the right side. So 6 divided by 2 is 3. Negative 3x divided by 2 is negative 3 over 2 times x. So we start out our y-intercept is the positive 3. Got there. Our slope of negative 3 over 2, we go down 3, run 2 to get our second point. And our line goes through those two points. <clears throat> That's one of the possible forms we can have in standard form. We could also have something like this. 2x minus 4y plus 8 equals 0. Some textbooks teach this is the only standard form is for an equation to equal 0. We still have to get y by itself. There are three things that have been done to y. y has been multiplied by a negative 4. And depending on what order you want to look at it, it has had 2x added to it and then 8 added to it as well. I could have said the 8 was added first. It wouldn't have made a difference. Um, but we typically want to work with the variable first. So to solve this, to get rid of the plus 8, we're going to subtract 8. So that's gone. I have 2x minus 4y on the left side. 0 minus 8 is just a negative 8. Next thing I get rid of the 2x, that was added, so I subtract 2x from both sides. Getting rid of the 2x on the left, giving me negative 4y equals, well, negative 8 minus 2x is just negative 8 minus 2x. And then we divide by the negative 4. So the negative 4 cancels out, we have y equals, negative 8 divided by negative 4 is a positive 2, Negative 2x divided by negative 4x, that's negative 2 over negative 4x. Well, negative over negative is a positive, and 2 over 4 reduces to 1 over 2, x. So if I want to graph this, start at the y-intercept of 2. If you from there, our slope of 1 half, we rise 1, and we run 2. Those are kind of close together, so we might do that again. Rise 1, run 2 to get to a third point. And then our line goes through those points. <clears throat> again, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have had your basic geometry class where you have talked about slope-intercept graphing and probably standard forms of equations graphing. There are shortcuts from standard form um, mostly from this form here, there are shortcuts where you can look at um, the slope from straight from the graph. The slope here, you take the coefficient of x, or the negative of the opposite of the coefficient of x, so that's 3 times x, so we'd use negative 3, over the coefficient of y, which is 2. That's what we had, negative 3 over 2 is our slope. The y-intercept 
is your constant here, 6 divided by the coefficient of y, which is 2. 6 over 2 is 3, which is what we had for our y-intercept. Something we have not discussed is something called an x-intercept. And if we are in this form of a standard equation, the x-intercept is that constant of 6 divided by the x coefficient of 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Now, we didn't technically um, set out to graph that, but we see right here that x equals 2 is where it crosses the x-axis. That would be an x-intercept. So we can use those intercepts for graphing as well from the standard form. For this course, we can pretty much, we're going to talk about y-intercepts and slopes as our shortcut. Um, but if you were to get into the statistics, linear programming and stuff like that, often it's quite a bit quicker to just use those two, the y-intercept and the x-intercept, using the two intercepts um, to graph a line so that we can get our feasible regions having problems. Um, I realize that might be going a little further than what you guys have seen before, but... Um, the intercepts are a very handy tool for graphing as you get into more complex situations for lines. So let's look, we talked a little bit about real life application for these. Let's look at another one. Let's look at the fluid in an IV bag. So let's say we have a 1200 milliliter bag at a flow rate of, let's go, 50 milliliters per minute. Actually, that's a little excessive. Let me cut that down. Let's go to a flow rate of 5 milliliters per minute, a little more realistic. So what we want to do here is we want to make a graph. Now we do have to come up with a scale. Uh, we want to be able to get down to zero milliliters of volume. Now time we said is usually our independent, that's the horizontal axis, and that is going to be exactly here. It's going to be the time from the start of the IV. And we want to scale this out. We're going to need to go probably for several hours here. So we might go 15 minutes, 30, 45, 60 minutes. That's one hour. Two hours, three hours. So we're going 15 minutes at a time here or a quarter of an hour. Then we need to scale up to 1,200 milliliters on our horizontal, or our vertical axis, I should say. Five, that's 500 milliliters. 100, not 5,000. 1,000 milliliters. And we're not quite going to make it up to 1,500, but we get the picture there. So for this graph, we start at 1,200 milliliters in the bag. And every minute, it drops by 5 milliliters. Well, we didn't scale this out one minute at a time down below. We went 15 minutes at a time. So 5 milliliters per minute times 15 minutes. We would write that as 15 minutes over 1. So the minutes cancel out, that is 75 milliliters in that 15 minutes. So we drop, for the first 15 minutes, we drop 75 milliliters. That would put us right here. Higher than that. At just over 1,100 milliliters. At 30 minutes, it puts us at 1050. 45 minutes puts us at... 9.75, and in an hour, what's this at 900 milliliters. Two hours puts us at 600. Three hours puts us at 300, and at four hours, that bag should be empty. 
there is the line describing the volume of fluid that is in the bay, in the IV bay. And the equation that would go with that, it would make sense, y equals 1,200, that's our y-intercept, minus, now I could do 5 milliliters per minute, where x is in minutes. Or it might make more sense, depending on how we're going to use it, to do 1,200 minus 300x, where x is in hours. So one of the things that is important to spell out if you're making these graphs and these equations is what does each variable stand for? Here, the equation is very different if we let x stand for minutes from the beginning of the infusion or if we let x stand for hours from the beginning of the infusion. Okay, so for right now, you guys had some homework on Friday that I gave you. Those were the pages 205, um, 1 through 3. Page 213 through 217, 1 through 15, the odds. And then new stuff based on this uh, slope and y-intercepts, the starting point rate of change on page 221 through 222, 1 through 15, the odds. Now to let you guys know our schedule on Wednesday, I will be logging on on Wednesday, but there will be no lecture. I will be on the network Wednesday at our normal time. It'll simply be for anybody who has help or questions on test three. I realize test three is a big step up in level of difficulty. So I do anticipate we didn't have any questions in the first 50 minutes from last Wednesday. But I wanted to give you time now that you've had time to work on the tests before you're required to submit them. Um, give you some time on Wednesday to ask those questions and get the tests finished up. So with that, I will let you guys out of here. You guys have a great day, and hopefully we'll see some of you on Wednesday. If not, you guys have a great Easter.